On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Frida, and Frida was married to an entitled abuser. It's a story of facades, fraud, infidelity, and forensic accounting. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. This is a podcast that gives a voice to survivors of domestic violence. I am Brandon Chadwick, but my friends call me Chad, and thanks for tuning in to this episode. So what is a narcissist, you may ask? Well, for the purposes of this podcast, we refer to a narcissist as anyone who has displayed a pattern of behavior that shows a limited capacity to appreciate others' perspectives. It is that simple. Now, if you want to be a guest on our show, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page says guest form. Click that button and away we will go from there. And if you also go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com, we now have a community support button at the top of the page, and that is for our very own safe social network. Our community members are on there posting in our forums. We have integrated Zoom support meetings every Wednesdays and Saturday nights. We have prompt workbooks for our episodes for you to dig deeper and gain more clarity into your relationships and life. You can create and run your own events from meditations to closure ceremonies. Our community members are on there. They're all amazing, and they're here to support you when you need it. They're here to cheer you on when needed as well. So if you are just looking for some support, I guarantee you, you will feel less alone by coming to our support group, and you'll make new friends in the process. So join our community today at Narcissus. Apocalypse.com, top of the page, community support button, and we will see you there. Another way to get support is to go to domesticshelters.org. So if you or someone you know are experiencing abuse, you are not alone. Domesticshelters.org offers an extensive library of articles and resources that can help you make sense of what you are experiencing. You can also connect with your local resources that include shelters and find ways to heal and move forward. So go to domesticshelters.org to access this free resource. So uh, our sponsor this week is Kin3.com. And Kin3.com is a female empowerment jewelry company. They have sponsored our show before. They make beautiful jewelry. And you will love it. And I know I have uh, my friend's bat mitzvah. It just happened. I will be getting something from Kin3.com. And I'm going to order it up this week. So it will, I'm just waiting for the address to be sent to me where it's actually going to be going so I can do it. So uh, please do go to our sponsor at kin3.com and you will not regret it. They make wonderful, beautiful jewelry and they also are listeners to this show as well. And what else do I have here on my list? Oh, uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month is almost upon us. So we here at Narcissist Apocalypse will be doing a run for domestic violence. And it will be taking place on October 30th at 8 p.m. And that's when I will be doing my run. You can do your run anytime. So you can raise money for an agency that you like, a shelter that you like, maybe for someone that you know that is struggling and, and needs the help as well, that they're in a domestic violence situation and needs help getting out, needs any sort of monetary help, or if you're just doing it to raise awareness. So we are going to be using the hashtag run for DV. And for the next month, I will be doing on our TikTok little updates of my training here and there for me to get up to the five kilometer run in the United States. It's a 3.1 uh, mile run and I need to get uh, my legs back into shape to make it that far. I'm a decent runner, but we'll see uh, what happens. I get injured a lot, so I have to get my stretching down. So if you want to watch uh, those videos, you can follow us on TikTok. I'll leave that in, in there as well. And now to our show. Our show today is with Frida, and Frida, you know, 
came from nothing and then found herself in this relationship with someone who was on the wealthier spectrum. A lot of fraud uh, type stuff, a lot of lies. And, you know, eventually you'll hear what happened. But it's it's an interesting uh, story. And I thank you for Frida. This is also a big trigger warning. This episode does uh, discuss uh, physical violence. And so a big thank you to Frida, especially uh, when I had like to do an emergency call to, to get this done uh, quickly. So thank you to uh, her. And now without further ado, here is my episode with Frida. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. With me today, we have Frida. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am doing well. And today we are going to hear your story. And you were in a marriage which eventually became, you know, a lot of financial abuse and and hiding of money and and things along Mm -hmm. those lines in in the aftermath as as the fight ensued. So this is uh, a story that uh, is all too common. So uh, Frida, I almost said your real name there. So Frida... (laughs) Thank you for being here today and sharing your story. And now without further ado, the floor is now yours. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you for letting me have this opportunity to share. I just want to thank the other women who have shared because their stories have really, um, you know, they've been therapy for me in my healing that is still going on almost four years later after this marriage. But, um, the only place to start is in my childhood and, uh, you know, I was raised by a narcissist mother. Um, as, as a kid, she, you know, I'll start from when I was born. She was, she says she was on heroin and immediately found out when, when she was pregnant with me that she kicked heroin. And I've never known who my father was. Um, I've had a lot of stories about, about him. Um, I think conveniently for her, she made him die in her story, her stories, but she has siblings who knew of her life then too, and I've heard different stories. So, so I just decided that I don't know who my biological father is and what that story is like. And, um, and I spent some time in foster care, um, between, you know, baby to, to age six years old. I have also, she had a boy, a son during that time. And, um, and I, I had a brother, so he too was in foster care with me. We were always together. I don't really remember much from foster care. I do the glimpses, the kind of, kind of flash memories. Um, they, they are, uh, uh, tra- traumatic what I can remember, but I don't have like, um, a storyline, I guess in my head. It's just, it's flashes of pictures and, and when we were taken into foster care, I never saw my mom. And, and then I learned later that she was in a rehabilitation, um, uh, center and for drug use. And, uh, she didn't come to see us. And my aunt is actually the one who went to the parenting class at, classes and filed for custody of us and got us out. And I didn't go back to my mom until I was six years old. Uh, same with my brother. At that time, she met a man who, uh, who she married and is my stepdad and my adoptive father. He adopted me and he raised me, but with her and life, he, he, he was a good, he is a good man. He's a simple man. And I think that he did the best that he could in, you know, being married to her and he had his own children too. So it was a blended family of, a lot of drama, a lot of chaos. Uh, my mom never got clean necessarily. It was always one thing or another. It was drinking mostly. That was mostly my whole life, her drinking. She was very emotionally and um, at times physically, but definitely emotionally and psychologically abusive during my childhood, especially as I became a teenager. She, uh, she I was the only girl. They, they ended up having a son together, and so it's a lot of boys and me, and she would always tell me, you know, I never wanted a daughter. I always wanted eight sons, but somehow I ended up with you. 
So for almost from the beginning, I was made to feel like I wasn't, um, I wasn't good enough, I guess, you know, I wasn't wanted, even though I'm, I didn't ask to be born, but I wasn't wanted. I was a burden. Um, we lived in Oregon at the time and, uh, I lived in a very small town, very, very small town, less than 2000 people farm town. Education wasn't really, um, uh, encouraged. It was, you know, finish high school and get a job or, or whatever you do, get out of my hair once you're done. So immediately after high school, I moved. Oh, I, to... I have a question first. Oh yeah. Sorry. So what was your role amongst you and your siblings? Uh, did you and your siblings get along Were you pitted against each other? And, or, or did you have like a good bond at least with your uh, biological uh, full brother? And was your mom someone, obviously she uh, was always stating that she didn't want you. Did she see you as a competition? Um, was she always trying to one up you in, in certain things? Right. These are great questions. And I, I think I was kind of speeding through my childhood because it, it's, you know, that's not the main story. Yes. So we were, we were all pitted against each other. Uh, to her, it was like a game or a soap opera, especially the step siblings. Um, you know, they were, she just really dogged on them and made us believe that they were, you know, that your dad loves them more and, you know, lots of, lots of nasty comments, uh, or ideas that she would put in our head of, of where we, we stood with them. I was definitely, because I was the oldest and the girl, I was meant to grow up real fast. I, you know, um, I, I was a mother role, especially when she was drinking that never stopped. And if she wasn't drinking, she, it was, it was religion. So we were, or both. So we were raised in the church and with very strict rules as they applied to her. So, you know, if it came to honoring our mother, whether the request was, was not normal, we had, we, we, religion was held over our head. Going to hell was held over our head. Um, if we weren't good girls and boys, you know, for our drunken mother, um, I was typically what, what you consider typically a pretty girl, I guess. Um, and, and, but she was very promiscuous, even with, with my dad. She had actually left my dad a couple, my stepdad who adopted me. She left him a couple of times once, once social media kind of got going, not necessarily, not like Facebook and MySpace and stuff weren't around just yet, but like chat rooms and that kind of thing. Or, and she started chatting with like her high school sweetheart and she had an affair with him. And, um, and there had been men at the house a couple of times that were, she said were just her friends when my dad would be working. Um, but, but, you know, she would say, she would kind of make fun of me in front of these people, you know, like my body, like, oh, you know, all 16 year old girls, unless they're twigs are, are you know, kind of baby fat, right? You're, you're kind of growing into this body. So I right away got hips and a butt and, um, and kind of just this curvy kind of Jessica rabbit figure, <laughs> um, a little early and, and, you know, she used that, she used that to say that I was overweight. Um, boys don't like girls that are kind of chubby, when I look back on pictures of myself, it was nowhere near chubby. And, uh, yeah, she would make me get up at like five thirty six in the morning and ride my bike saying, you know, you're gaining a little bit too much weight. Meanwhile, my, my siblings are sleeping and she's, you know, she's hung over half the time, but I'm out on a bike ride for over an hour because she thinks my body's getting too thick. Um, so there was a lot, there was a lot of body image stuff like that. And because of her own insecurities, but I didn't know that at that time I was just a teenager. I also in high school, um, it was like by my junior or senior year was developing really bad stomach problems, like anxiety type stomach problems, um, vomiting and, uh, uh, 
like irritable bowel kind of things. And I kept going in for tests, kept going in for tests. And I remember doctors and nurses would pull me away and they would say, is everything safe at home? And, and I'm currently um, finishing up my nursing degree. And now I know that IBS is most often, tri- especially in young people, triggered by stress or trauma. But I was so afraid to say that anything out of the norm was happening at home um, that there was no, there was no way that I was going to, you know, she's the one who took me to the appointment. So even though they pulled me away, I knew she was sitting out in the lobby. There's no way I'm going to say, yeah, actually my mom, my mom is, you know, she says cruel things to me. She hits me. Um, in 2003, July 3rd, 2003, I'll never forget it. She came home so drunk and I had forgotten to feed my my youngest brother, who was 10 at the time. He could have very well made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but I'd forgotten to feed him dinner because I fell asleep on the couch and she came home and literally beat the living hell out of me, punching me in the face. Um, she slammed the back of my head into like one of those coat hooks that... Um, you know, you hang behind the door or whatever, the, a metal, the metal hook. Mm-hmm. Um, she just grabbed my face and she slammed my head into it. And I still to this day have like a, um, like an osteoma cut type of scar in my skull that I can feel, feel. Um, and, and that same day too, I had real long hair. I wore, I wore my hair really long. I have thick hair too. She was always, she always made comments about my hair because she has very thin, wispy hair. And, and I had, you know, I have thick hair and she grabbed, I has, I was wearing a ponytail and she yanked me up by my ponytail and she's like, you and this fucking hair and grab scissors, um, to like, to chop off my ponytail. And that is, that is the only moment that I pushed back. I was not going to let her cut my hair. <laughs> and, um, and it, it was just chaotic, but I had, I had managed to grab the phone and call 911, but she smacked it out of my hand. And I didn't know that, that it had actually dialed and that the officer could hear everything. And at the time it was a cordless phone, so it wasn't a cell phone. And and there was maybe 10 minutes later a knock at the door and I was taken out of the home. Um, But again, I grew up in a small farm town. And so the officer said to me, you know, there wasn't, it wasn't very sophisticated. The officer said to me, look, you're 17 years old. You're, you're going to be 18 in six months. You can either stick this out for six months. You can go to foster care for six months, which I know you don't want to do, or you can emancipate yourself. But either way, it's six more months with her and you can go. And I was taken back next day and I was grounded for God knows the whole summer because that was my, because I didn't, you know, it was my fault that the cops showed up and then I embarrassed her. So you said that that was, one of the first times you fought back or pushed back. So is it also fair to say that you did not have uh, a voice in a way that you were too afraid to speak up a lot of the time and you self silenced yourself a lot? 100%. And that has, I am 35. So that has carried into the last three years of my life, honestly. Um, and I have often been accused of giving this silent treatment, which is passive aggressive, right? I'm not, I don't, I don't, in my mind, I'm not punishing somebody with silence. It's that I have not, I have not been allowed to, to say I'm angry or say, hey, when this happened, I was upset by that. So, so I retreat inside and process my feelings and put them away where they need to go. And that, takes me a while and then when once it's done I can come out and pretend like like I'm fine I'm done I've moved on you know there's no reason to make a big deal out of this anymore so yes as I I learned that very young too with her I I had tried a few times like mom you 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 punched me in the face well if you hadn't done this that would so it was always put back in my face as to why I deserved you know she would often say God, I haven't said my own name. <laughs> God, Frida, you, you're, um, you're such a victim. You love to play the victim. There's no victims in this life. So, you know, I learned young that, that my feelings didn't matter. 
So right here, you're 18 years old, you're leaving the home, you uh, don't feel like your feelings matter. It's very difficult for you to uh, discuss how you're feeling with other people. So it's not easy for you to speak up, especially if someone is going to be angry at you, is going to be raging at you. You don't feel like yeah. you're good enough. You've been dealing with uh, competition type behavior your whole life. So uh, obviously it, within, with all of these things, you feel probably like you have to be something or earn someone's love instead of just being who you are. Um, and I have one question, I guess, before we continue, as far as belief systems go, were you religious and did you have specific religious beliefs that are part of your story? Yes. So, so thank you for coming back to that. Uh, so because I grew up such a strict religion, strict religious, I grew up assembly of God and um, like with speaking of tongues and laying on of hands and and stuff that's kind of scary to a young person. It's kind of scary to an older person, but um, but it's very much if you wanted to legitimize uh, having sex, you needed to do that, or living together, you needed to do that by getting married. And as a woman in this this community, we we were to get married right away and serve our husbands. Um, we were to be subordinate and not, that's how I was raised. Even though that's not the way that my home operated behind closed doors, my mom was very much the, the, you know, the, she wore the pants. It, it was the idea. It was the, the umbrella of, of, uh, our belief system, though, is that women grow up, they get married, they have kids, and they serve their husbands. So I, that was my mentality. And that's also another reason why um, education wasn't really pushed very hard is because ultimately I wasn't going to need it. I, I was going to serve my husband and be taken care of. I was also very, very poor uh you know, having a mother who drank. Even though my dad worked and he worked nights, I grew up, you know, on the wrong side of town kind of a thing. And that's why I had a job so young was to kind of supplement. Like if I, if I wanted school clothes, I was buying them for myself. And the only way to do that was to have a job. I also had to pay my mom for, uh, for laundry detergent, the use of the washer, um, electricity, like part of the electricity for use of turning on the lights. Meanwhile, my brothers didn't have, they didn't, they still don't work hardly. Uh, so it, in a lot of ways, I'm kind of grateful because, because it, it, it was a motivator to, to, to get out and never come back. And I knew the only way to do that was through work, you know, through working and, and saving whatever money I could. Um, so, but that, that religious aspect of it, that religious upbringing, that, that foundation, that fundamental foundation that was built, that stayed with me for a very long time. And it, it is the reason that I married my narc. And so I moved to Portland, Oregon, and that to me was the big, big, big city. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, it, if anyone's been there, it's, it's a lovely city, but it's, uh, it's probably on the smaller end of, of you know, metropolis type of things going on, at least at that time. Um, certainly New York, LA, Phoenix, those, those kind of places are, are a little more sophisticated than Portland. But to me, that was big time. And I got a job right away and, and I was living with like another girlfriend there and it was probably, I was there six months, maybe I dated a couple boys here and there. Again, I'm only 19 years old. So, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not dating with any sort of guidance either. They're just like, if they're interested in me, then, then I give it a shot, you know? Uh, but, but nothing serious. And there was this one guy who turns out to be my narc. He kept coming into my office because we did payroll for his company. And so he would come and pick up the payroll every week and we would talk and kind of flirt and, 
And I thought, oh, I really like this guy. He's, he's very personable. He's very charming. He's a salesperson. So, of course, he's charming and personable. Uh, and so he came in one week and he said, hey, I just want to let you know I'm getting a promotion next week. Somebody else will be coming to – or next week is my last week picking up payroll and then a new person's going to come. And I thought, oh, my gosh, is this going to be the last time I, I see him? I've got, like, this kind of crush on him. So he came in for his last time, and I, I just kind of worked up the courage. and was like, hey, do you want a dinner sometime? And he was like, okay, sounds good. We planned to meet for dinner. We had our first date. Um, there was nothing immediately kind of off-putting. He was, like I said, he was very charming. He was five years older than I am. And now looking back as a 35-year-old, and especially as a mother of daughters, I would not want my 19-year-olds dating a 24-year-old. There's just a huge maturity difference that, I, I don't know, maybe if they were 25 and 30 or 30 and 35, but at 19 years old, you don't know yourself. You shouldn't be dating a 24-year-old. Again, I was an adult. I could do whatever I wanted, but but I was just too young to be seeing somebody, be seeing a 24-year-old at the time. Um so we got a couple. We got a couple more times, and I'm I'm learning that um, he's so he doesn't, he doesn't love bomb. That I hear a lot of people talk about love bomb. He like lust bombs um, right away. Is flattering. You know, you're beautiful. You're uh, you're very. You love your eyes. You're just a lot of compliments of my physical person, but. But doesn't really try and, like, know me, anything much about me. I'm the one doing a lot of question asking, you know. So he's from a very wealthy family. He, he had moved from um, Seattle. He had been in the, you know, he had at the time told me he had done some time in the military, in the Air Force, um, and went to, and graduated from the University of Minnesota with a degree in social anthropology. This is what he's telling me at this time. And I have no reason to question any of it because it's like, why would anybody, why would anybody make up their background? You know, I, again, I'm 19, I'm very naive from a small town. And um, he's in the process of buying this really great condo uh, close to downtown Portland with a view and, and it's just striking. And he's taking me to really nice dinners and doing a lot of this lust bombing that I, I say. So I had never seen this kind of sophisticated lifestyle before. Again, I lived on a farm. <laughs> That's a very simple life. Um, and he's taking me, he's taking me to restaurants where you, there's a dress code. It, you know, and I'm, I'm calling him saying, what do I, I don't even know what, what does that mean? What do I wear where there's a dress code? And almost immediately it's a power shift because I, he never asks me, where do I want to go? Or what do I feel like having for dinner? You know, what kind of date do I feel like going on? He's, he's just doing it. And, and I'm not, I'm not protesting because I don't have that kind of money to, to make a reservation and that means that's going to be on me to pay for it or I can't expect him to pay for it just because I made so I just do whatever he says whatever he says goes I just I just follow along I'm very very enamored by what I'm seeing what I'm experiencing so you're experiencing these things for the first time as far as that this type of lifestyle and it is you know, it's a big wow in a way. I can't, you know, I can't believe like maybe I'm in this or, or, or going on in the sense of um, this is stuff that you never thought you'd be involved in. You've been scratching tooth and nail to live your whole entire life. And at the same time, you are aware that you're not able to make decisions per se and that the the struggle for you is... With this type of person, I'm going to assume, and, and tell me if I am wrong, because of what they are used to in their life, 
that if you want to do something that is maybe more low key and if you were to make plans of, of any sort and do something lower key that um, one, you couldn't afford it. And then two, he might see you as lesser than lesser than. Yeah. Or unimpressive, you okay. know, simple, very simple. And, 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 you did, and, and you did, and you did not want to risk that because right now this is like, this is everyone's dream in a sense, especially if you're coming from, a poor background that like, Oh my right. God, Prince charming has just walked through the door. He's done nothing wrong. He's only been fantastic toward me uh, since I've met him. I'm the one that asked him out originally. So I don't, you know, there's like, that's a big thing right there where you're the one that asked him out. So you're not thinking that whatever's going to happen is going to happen because you were the initiator here as far as making the first move. So it's the furthest thing from your mind that this person is anything like your mom. A hundred percent. And he's the first, uh, he's the first glimpse of stability I've ever seen. Right. He's about to buy his house. Uh, he, he, he has this great job, um, he had a nice car, you know, I was driving like a crappy Honda Civic with a dent in the door, you know? So, so he, he, he has, he has a, like a lot of impressive things that somebody who's never had anything. Is he like, when you tell him about your past, is he able to relate to you in any way? Does he give you, uh, I guess, positive, uh, not positive feedback, but does he give you the uh, validation that you're looking for when he hears those things? At first, yes. At first. They they were later weaponized against me, but at first, I, it was almost fuel to his fire, I think, of showing off, um, knowing that, you know, I'm, I'm from a small poor farm town and I don't have a really solid family background and, and Portland's the big city to me. Yeah. I, I think it, I think it played right into what I now know as his own fragile ego, but it was making him feel like the big man, you know, larger than life. Yeah. Like you are for this type of person, he's looking for someone like you. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, to just be enamored and in awe of of what he does, and his family is very, very, very wealthy. Um, his dad worked directly for another um, uh, software computer company that isn't Apple, <laughs> and that guy's still alive and buying a lot of property. I don't know if I'm allowed to say his name and going through a horrible divorce in the media right now. Uh, so his dad worked directly for him in. in Washington, like they're, they're from Seattle. So, uh, his family, they had multiple homes, um, throughout the country. They, they lived very, uh, a very, I don't, if I can compare it to something, it's almost like watching the Kardashians to me, the way they lived is, is, is unattainable to the regular person your jaw drops at the sight of their homes or you hear where they've been. And, and, um, you know, his mom would, would wear like $40,000 in diamonds as her everyday jewelry. That was no big deal. That wasn't her going out jewelry. That was her going to Costco jewelry. Uh, so. Still shopped at Costco though. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. They were, they were still a uh, pretty, you know, I, even though the story is not a, a great story, there's still a lot of good things that I learned and, and learning finances from them was, was really impactful in my life. And, and there were still with like nuggets of wisdom that I use today, um, about, you know, staying out of debt and not living beyond your means and, you know, limiting credit card use. So there were a lot of, there were a lot of wise things that I learned from my narc's dad, um, and, and, and his parents. And yeah, even though they, they had this grand life, they still shop to Costco. <laughs> and if Costco is listening, um, you know, we would love to have you as a sponsor on the show. <laughs> For sure. 
<laughs> Rich, poor, it doesn't matter. Everyone uses Costco. Shop there now. That's true. That is the truth. Yes. So, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very charmed at this point. And, and there are a couple things that are kind of coming up, but I am ignoring them because I think this is how the rich are. He was very nasty to wait staff. And I had always heard my whole life run from somebody who's nasty to the, the waiters and waitresses, but he was rich, you know? So I thought, well, maybe this is how the rich treat me. Maybe this is expected in the industry. You come to these nice restaurants and and you have rich clientele. And sometimes they are snotty because they have the money to be snotty. But I did say something one time after leaving because I was just so embarrassed. Because he was always worse to the women. Always worse to the women waitresses than, than waiters. And I said, I don't know why you feel like you need to treat them like that. And... And that was the first time I had realized I shouldn't talk back because right away it was, it was, um, he, he just sort of snapped and he hadn't done that before. And it's like, what do you know about ordering from these kind of restaurants? What do you know about what dealing with these kind of people? And I, right away, like, again, I don't, I'm not, at the time I wasn't really somebody who spoke up if corrected. I just sort of retreated inside and, and, I, and I just didn't say anything after that. And I never brought it up again, but it always disgusted me. So, so uh, I guess how long until you were, I guess, officially hooked in where, you know, this was uh, a hook, line and sinker. I I'm in, was there an event that happened? And then did this, obviously you're talking here about the, um, the stuff that's going on at, at the restaurants, it's not specifically done to you. What, uh, and I guess my question would be like, does devaluation start uh, on you before you're hooked in or does it happen, I guess, after? And I know that's two different questions. No, no, it, it is after. Yeah. It, it, more for me, it's, I'm just going along with whatever dates he has planned. Um, he's calling the shots. I don't ever call him either. He, he's the one who calls me. But this is probably, we're about, I don't know, maybe three or four weeks into dating. And that's when I say that about the waitress or waiter. I, I kind of can't remember now. It's been so long. Um, but when I was hooked was my birthday was approaching as we were newly dating. And he planned um, a beach getaway or a coast getaway. We don't call it the beach in Oregon. It's called the coast. Um, for my birthday, for a birthday weekend, and and we're driving up there. One, I'm not allowed to pick the music. That was that was like right away uh, implied. So I'm not allowed to mess with the radio or pick the music. But it's done in like a, kind of a flirty way. So I just sort of to me, it's like well, that's weird, but I don't make a big deal about it. And it, it's about an hour drive to the coast from Portland, and we stay in a cute little bed and breakfast, and. I noticed that he smells like cigarette smoke. And I had specifically said, I don't date guys who smoke. It's disgusting. I don't. And he was like, yeah, it's totally gross. But his hand smelled like cigarette smoke. And I commented on it and said, I, I, I said something, you know, like, why do your hands smell like cigarettes? Oh, my roommate, uh, my roommate, you know, because he's living in an apartment as the condo was in escrow. My roommate smokes and I was sitting out on the patio with him before I came to pick you up to drive out here. And I, I thought, so that's kind of the first, to, to me, that's the first like significant memory of like little lies and deceit. Cause he did smoke. He did smoke. I caught him smoking. I had driven by him, you know, a few weeks later, um, we had passed each other on the road and he had his hand out the window with a cigarette. And I, and I learned that he smoked, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't make a big deal out of it because he was still hiding it from me. And I was like, well, at least if I don't have to know about it, you know, I'll make an exception for this. But we do the beach weekend and that's when I'm like in, I'm in, I'm like this guy, he takes me on. Oh, another thing he did too <laughs> during this beach trip is we went and looked at open houses. He goes, Hey, you want to look at open houses with me? Even though my, my house is in escrow, do I look at open houses? And I was like, Oh, okay. And this, 
the little girl in me, or not even a little girl, the, the girl that grew up with religion, which is also, he said that he too was raised religiously and, and his parents were, they did practice, um, like a Christian based faith, but I wouldn't say that he participated. Uh, but he definitely, he was definitely well versed and knew, he knew how to use it to his advantage. Um, but we went, we would look at open houses and he would say little things like, gosh, imagine if we bought this beach house and look at this yard. So, so I don't even, I don't know if there's a word for it, but he did a lot of like painting the picture of a we idea of a us. So of he, a future. Yeah. So he was future faking. He was creating a future that you would both uh, want. Yeah. And, and again, Growing up knowing that I needed to get married and and be a wife in order to be legitimized in society, that 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 right away was like, oh my gosh, this is wonderful. So we do that. We come home from the date, and then he ghosts me. He just radio silence on the phone. I don't I don't hear. He dropped off my house, and I don't hear from him. I don't hear from him for, for like two weeks. And I think, oh my gosh, what happened? You know, and now I'm kind of like 19 year old girl, frantic and flustered and sending text messages and leaving messages like, Hey, what is everything? Okay. You know, did you end up in the hospital and you haven't been it like trying to make a joke of it. And then, he, then I hear from him and there's kind of no good explanation. He's just like, sorry, I got busy. And, and he goes, you know, my, I've been packing up my house. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to move into my condo. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's legit. I was like, you could have sent a text. Um, and he goes, you know, I also think that I need like me time Mondays. I was like, me time Monday. And he's like, yeah. So Mondays, you don't get to contact me and you don't, we don't see each other on Monday nights. You can call me Tuesday. So it's Tuesday morning hits. That's fine. But not on Mondays. It's me time Monday. Oh, that is, I have never heard anything like that, but, but okay, sure. So this is like, you know, three or four weeks into dating and, and, and two weeks of ghosting. So it's about six weeks and, and he needs me time Mondays. We're just getting to know each other. You know, my idea of like a new couple is that they just can't get enough of each other and, and they want to spend every moment together, you know, your, your, your brain is kind of like addicted to your new relationship for a while, but he, he wanted, he wanted time off or he wanted space on Mondays. Another thing is he was a big time pot smoker. This too, I did not know. And I, I was anti-drugs, like all of them. Oh, so, well, well, sorry, just before we get to the pot smoking, I just want to point out here that, you know, that you had the whirlwind first four weeks. You've been sucked in here pretty hard. Then he does the silent treatment on you, contacts you again, starts setting controlling type of uh, commands as far as when you can see him, when you cannot see him. And you take him back. So here he is testing your boundary fence as far as what you will deal with and what you won't deal with. And he's been successful in creating a silent treatment of two weeks and then giving his demand of when he wants to see you and it's accepted. So now for him, he's able to move forward knowing he's able to do these things pretty quickly. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and I am just too naive to realize this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. And again, like I said, there was an immediate power well, shift. Sorry, you're, well, you're, well, you're not too naive. Uh, you were already had a lot of issues before that were brought in here. That's not to say that every person who goes through this has issues going in as we've discuss that many times sometimes they're created while you're in there but mm -hmm. you uh, feel like cre uh, stating what you want in your voice 
doesn't matter and you don't want to ruin things based upon everything that's already happened in your life. So for you, um, that boundary right away is gone. And yeah. it was, it was just, it was a lot easier for him because he's looking for someone like you. Right. Right. And I was a sitting duck 100%. And also another thing is I was new to Portland. Like I said, I was subletting a room, um, you know, that a woman was renting out of a large house. So I didn't, I had, Oh, oh, I said I moved there with my girlfriend. By this time, I had moved into a room. You, you know, I, I, had, I started subletting a, a room. So I'm living on my own. And I know my girlfriend that lives there. And then I know him. You know, and then my coworker. So I have, I don't have a, a social network there. I don't have girlfriends that I can call and get together for, I don't have anything distracting me from the stream, from, from, this relationship, you know, it, it is the highlight of my life. I go to work, I come home and I date him. And and when I do go on dates with him, they're great dates. So, so I was lonely and, and trying to kind of navigate how to make new friends and this new relationship, new job, new place, all of these news. Uh, um, so it was easy to kind of write off his ghosting and his strange Monday request, you know, like, okay, I have no one else. So I've got nothing else going on. If he wants to hang out Tuesday through Sunday, then, then it's no big deal to me. Um, yeah. So, so back to the marijuana. Oh, right. Right. So I, I somehow learned that he, I think he invited me to a Halloween party. That's what it was. And he got high at the party. And I had asked him, I said, you know, I told him kind of right away. I'm like, I'm not, I really don't, I don't like drug use of any kind. Uh, and he's like, it's not a big deal. It's just like we're at a party. And I was like, okay, it, if it's social, then, then, you know, I guess I could be a little more flexible to that. But, you know, I was raised by a drunk and a drug addict. I, I don't, I'm, I'm like a, a no drugs policy person. Um, and he's like, I think you're just being sensitive about that. Like, this is, it's just a party thing. And I was like, okay, that's, that's fine. You know, I, I don't really like to take shots, but I'll do, I'll take shots at a party kind of idea. That's like, how I rationalized it in my head. Um, but it turned out that it was a daily thing, an everyday thing, but that was revealed only slowly to me over time. Um, first it was, I've got a bad headache after work and you know, tomorrow's a big meeting, so I need to sleep really well tonight. There, it, new excuses just kept coming and coming and coming until I realized it, it's a habit. It's, it's, you awake and bake. You, you, this is your lifestyle to be stoned all the time. But by then I, you know, this, this is over a period of, of weeks, months and whatnot. So I just have rationalized it away. Um, and, you know, he, so now we're together maybe six months, six or seven months, still doing, still, I'm still renting a room, still, still doing me time Monday kind of thing, but something doesn't feel right to me. And so I look at his computer. I was using his computer to use, to write a resume. I was looking for a new job, but I figured I was on there. I'll go through the history. And he He's on like six different sites chatting with however many women on these sites. And there's one that there's one that's like pictures are being exchanged and like, it's very sexually graphic and I am devastated, just devastated. Like the whole time. And most of them, most of the dates are Monday nights. <laughs> You know, there's a few like, are we going to meet up tonight? And, you know, I, I, I'm just gutted when this happens. And right away, I, I just say, I, I, I don't want, I can't be with you. I don't want to be with you. You, you've been cheating on me. And he's like, it's not cheating. We're, we're casually seeing each other. It's not cheating. And I was like, this is cheating. I've been committed to you. Like, I thought we were a couple. 
he also hasn't he hasn't said I love you. You know, it's been six seven six or seven months. He he hasn't said I love you, and I haven't said it either. I'm I'm under the the idea that women don't say at first, men say at first, but he's never told me that. And in his defense, he didn't ever come out and, and we we never like what do they what do the young kids call it now DTR. We never defined the relationship at that time, but it but we were spending. You know, we were doing everything couples did. We, we were going on dates and we were seeing each other a few times a week and we were spending, doing overnights at his, his by this time, sorry, he's in his, he's moved into his condo. So, you know, we're staying overnight in, in his condo and we're going on weekend trips and. So he's passing it off to you at this point that, oh, I thought we were in a casual relationship of seven yeah. months. Yeah. And, and I. I think to myself, well, how can I argue with that? We, we haven't said, we haven't made any sort of acknowledgement out loud of commitment. Well, I do break it off. I break it off for three months. I break it off for three months. And I, then I get a call from him randomly. So like I said, I was subletting a room, but I really, I, I'm an animal person. And growing up on a farm, I had tons of animals. So you know, I anytime we would be out and I'd see a puppy or a dog or whatever, I'd, I'd swoon over over this, you know, cute bundle of, of puppy. So he calls me and he says, I got something to show you. And I was like, I haven't heard from you in three months. What? what? But I still, you know, I still, my heart was still broken. So when he did call, oh, and another thing, I do, I do want to point out, he didn't call or text that whole time. He didn't apologize. He didn't ask me back. He didn't say... Any, it was radio silence for that three months, and it was killing that. That too was killing me. Like he doesn't even care. He's not even calling to apologize. He's not even calling to explain himself. Like what? You know, I what? <laughs> but I, I was really young. And now I know. Like God, let him go. Let him buy. See ya. But but then it was like you kind of want a little drama. I think when you're 19 years old. Well, so, for, well, for you, you've been used to drama your yeah. whole life. So this is normal to you. And right. ca- chaos is, is a normal thing. It, it doesn't scare a person away like it would. It doesn't scare someone who's never been in this type of stuff before. For someone like that, they would probably run away. But for people who are used to all of this type of stuff, it doesn't phase yeah. For the most part, it doesn't phase you. It doesn't. It really doesn't. Yeah, that's true. But at the end, or like, you know, so around Christmas, that's, that's, that would be like the near the end of the three months at this time. I get, I do get a call from him saying, I have something to show you. And I was like, oh, okay. And, um, so I have to work this week, but you know, maybe we'll find time to get together. And he shows up at my work with a puppy and it's not just any puppy. It's it's a Shiba Inu. It's the you know an exotic, expensive designer puppy. It's not. He didn't go to the pound for this dog. He he bought it from a breeder. It had papers. It was several thousand dollars. It, you know, again, like a very grand, a grand gesture to 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 impress me with. And he shows up my work, and I am instantly hooked. You know, oh my gosh, this dog is so cute. And he's like, it's our dog. Like, I want us to be responsible for this dog together. And I, I say, okay, you know, no second thoughts. Oh, okay. I, 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 I'm not even asking, I'm not even confirming. So does this mean we're back together? In my head, it solidifies. We're back together. We're committed. He does, he does want me. Who, who gets a puppy with somebody that you don't want a future with? It's like a practice kit, you know, all these rationalizations in my mind. And at, the, and at this point, you know, you now have a shared responsibility. You are a team and that now is the official commitment that you're looking for and you forgive everything that has happened in the past. And it's like you start brand new here. Somewhat. So, so I say, you know, the puppy... I'm, I'm already in, I'm already committed. Um, so we, we do kind of start back on track, but I find again, you know, I, I, and he's behaving, he's, he's, he's 
behaving in the relationship, I guess, you know, and, um, it's, it's seeming like he's becoming more committed. He's calling me regularly. He's calling me at work on my lunch just to say hello. And he's doing a lot of like charming things that are, my guard is coming, coming back down. And I, and I have said in this time, like, um, you know, how come I haven't met your parents? How come we haven't, how come we haven't met each other's parents? Oh, you don't want to meet my family. You, you don't want to meet them. They're so judgy. They're, you're not, you know, they're not going to like you. And it's not anything that you've done. They're just like this. They're nasty. My mom is an awful person. You know, so he talked a lot of crap about his mom. Again, something that I should know that men who aren't good to their mamas are not going to be good to you. Um, but I, I just, the way he paints them is if he's this troubled, or he's the, he's the black sheep and they worship his sister and, um, and his mom is the leader of that, that system. And so I don't, I don't meet them for a while, but I'm starting to like, again, my, I'm starting to red flags again. And I check the computer again. Too. I'm like, well, God, he's lying again, you know, or he, he, not lying. It's just like coming up with stories again. You know, there's excuses for why, why we don't progress. And again, he's talking to women and, and he, again, he still hasn't said, I love you. This, this, this still hasn't been exchanged. And I sitting there crying in his room when he comes in, I'm like, you're talking to girls again. Am I, am I not enough for you? I, I don't. And, and right away, no, you're, be- you're the most beautiful girl I've seen. I'm so stupid. I said, you know, I, I, what are we doing? You don't even tell me that you love me. So we have a dog, but you don't, you've not, we don't even say I love you. Like you've never said that. He goes, well, you won't let me love you. I said, what? He goes, yeah, I just want to, I want to help you, but you don't even let me help you. And how can I love somebody that doesn't let me help you? I said, where do I need help at? And I had some medical debt from all of the stomach problems that I had. I had I had probably close to like ten thousand dollars in medical debt because I didn't have insurance, and I was making like the minimum payment on them at the time. And he's like, "You have all this debt, and you don't you don't let me help you take care of yourself. So how can I lo- how can I tell somebody I love them if they don't even let me care for them?" And I I was so twisted up when he said that he wrote me a check for $10,000 right there. I was bought and paid for right there. I didn't bring up the girl that he was chatting with ever again. I cashed the check. I paid off my debt and I thought I was the problem. Well, yeah, maybe I am cold and closed off and, and that's what's leading him to talk to the other women. Maybe, maybe it is me not allowing my, Myself. Maybe I'm too trying too hard to be independent when that's not the kind of person he wants to be with. He wants to take care of his woman. So we go on for another year. Uh, we move in together, and and I am the one who says, you know, so we're we're two years of dating, and a, a lot of similar kind of weird scenarios happen in this time, and. I say, you know, where's this going? Do you, do you see us getting married or, or do you see us just doing this? Because if you do, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to move on with my life. I, I do want to get married eventually. And, and if you don't see that happening, um, then, then we don't need to. And he's like, are you giving me an ultimatum to marry you? That sounds like an ultimatum. And maybe it was, I don't, I don't, in my mind it wasn't, but, but I could see where maybe somebody might hear like either marry me or I'm leaving kind of a thing. And so he proposes relatively soon after that, a huge diamond, you know, something that like is worthy of showing off and feeling like you're, you're top of the world. And I say yes. And, and, and we get married and four of my, the four girls I asked to be my bridesmaid, protested like the last they had like an intervention like the month before the wedding supposed to go down and said you can't marry him. they begged me you cannot marry him he's all wrong for you but I was one month from the wedding you know um they they said we can't support this and I the only person that stood with me at the wedding was my sister 
I had a panic attack the week of the wedding. I can still see the grout, the mold in the grout of the shower during, because I had a panic attack in the shower. And to this day, I can still see where my eyes focused on the mold of the grout to try and just bring my brain back to reality because I was like, this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea. But people are invited and a dress is bought and food is paid for and, you know, the whole shebang. And I went through with it knowing that it was probably the worst decision of my life. And shortly after, without telling me, he quit his job and opened up a music shop. So this is 2008. Um, A music music shop being a record store? Sorry, like an instrument, like guitar. He played guitar. So he opens a guitar shop and he, you know, and other instruments and whatnot. But it's 2008. I mean, guitar, what's the guitar, guitar center? The big box store had already like kind of taken off by then. But he doesn't discuss it with me like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to quit my job and open a guitar center or a guitar store. He just does it. I, I find out, I find out after it's open. And I get a second job because, because it's like, this is 2008. Like nobody's buying luxury items. Everybody's trying to salvage what money they have left. Um, but, but he's like, this is my dream. And I I have, I have done this. I've wanted to open a guitar shop my whole life and I can do it now. And I I thought, I can't remember thinking like, is he doing this because I have a good job? So I worked for a huge defense company as a project manager and I, I had a really great job. Um, and so I I was the one paying all of the bills, all of them, the mortgage, everything, the paint car payments, all of it while he's trying to get this business going. It's not bringing in a dime. He's not coming home either. He's like, I have to work. He's working late all the time. And I also find out he's like part of like a underground poker club. Um, so he's going to that every week. And, and I'm asking why money's not being brought in from the store. And he's like, well, you know, the first five years of business are really hard. Um, you know, I'm probably not going to make much money. You're going to, you're going you're gonna to work. So I get a second job on, on the weekends in a furniture store as a salesperson, just trying to supplement the income. So we're not even seeing each other for the first year of our marriage, you know, maybe, maybe off and on. Um, there's a lot of like sexual rejection, you know, anytime I'm trying, I'm, trying to be intimate with him. Um, you know, he's, he's saying to me, God, you only want sex when I'm, when we do see each other. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, we're, I'm working two jobs. You're running this music shop and we're newlyweds, but you're making me feel bad because I'm desiring an intimate relationship with my husband. You know, um, I was very motive, self-motivated to not ever be poor again And to take care of myself, you know, moving back to my parents' house was never going to be an option kind of a thing. And so I think he, and and he saw me working my, really working hard. Um, I started out as the administrative assistant for this defense company and I worked for promotion after promotion after promotion and and got a really great salary. And I think that that's why he agreed to marry me was like, okay, yeah, she's, she is, she's stability in, in his own twisted way, you know? Um, and I let him get away with anything. I'm stability without accountability. It's amazing here how the roles of both of you have been reversed in in this Mm -hmm. sense. And that, you know, you were trying to be, well, yes and no, you were trying to find stability and you found stability yourself on your own and in the process of doing that, this person who is unstable presented themselves as stable, looking for someone who they could impress. And then you became the stable overall in every way. And then they got to still be their unstable self, but now they're going to show it more fully. Yeah. yeah well now, now, now the mask was off. Yeah, I, the, ma- I was- the mask is off. I'm sorry yeah, if I'm, I'm confusing everyone who's listening by my little analogies here. I don't know if they're making no, sense. No, it's but... not confusing. Okay. I'm probably confusing with, with how I jump around and I Oh, not at all. Um, another thing about this, this music shop is he said his parents gave him $20,000 to, um, 
to start it. So he, he said that both he and his sister got $20,000 and they could use it either for a wedding or for whatever they wanted. So at the time, this money was gifted during this time we're getting married, but he uses it to start the shop. So again, this is probably why he didn't tell me that he was opening the music shop. He didn't want to tell me about the money. Um, anyway, so I, I'm, I'm working and I'm paying the mortgage and we're about a year. So, to, you know, from 2008 to 2009, we're about a year in our marriage. And there are times in this, I thought, I kept thinking I could leave now. I could get myself a little condo, you know, because 2008, 2009, everybody's foreclosing on their houses and dumping them. And I have a little nest egg and, and I'm thinking to myself, I, this is like my opportunity to, to, to start my own thing if I wanted to, but, but the religious upbringing that I had, it said, no, you know, when you're married, you're married, you're committed, you're in, there's no divorce. And, and so that was always like a nagging little voice in the back of my head. But one night I'm home and there's a knock at the door and I don't recognize who it is. So I don't, I don't go downstairs and my dog is barking. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to let him, I'm going to let him bark. And, and my narc is at the music shop or wherever he's at. And the, the person doesn't go away and they're holding a badge. They keep flashing it at the windows, uh, like a, not, not like a police badge, like a, uh, like a name tag bag, like a j- journalist badge or something. So I'm like, okay, he's got some papers in his hand. So I open the door and he serves me with foreclosure papers. And he says, your house is about to be foreclosed on, and I'll, I'll never forget the date, February 24th, 2009. I said, what? I've been, pay- I've been paying the mortgage. And I ran upstairs, and you, at the time, uh, I don't know about younger listeners, but all the carbon copies on the back of checks, I had them all. I said, here, here, here's proof. I, I, I've been paying the mortgage. And so he opens up the thing, and he goes, no, there's a $50,000 lien against the house, that's delinquent. And I, I was so confusing. It was, and you, your property taxes haven't been paid in the last four or five months or whatnot. So, you know, there's, or, or the last, I'm sorry, for the last term, you know, they're paid every two, you pay them twice a year. So they weren't paid on the last payment time. We pay your, your property, you get your annual property tax and you pay it in halves. So I thought, that's crazy. I, I said that I was, I, I wrote him a check for the property taxes. So take all, I'm really confused. I'm really, really confused at this time. I'm not thinking, I, I'm thinking there's a, like a clerical error. I'm not thinking that there's any sort of deceit going on. Because I've been making, because I have proof in my accounts that, that I'm making payments on everything. And, um, and he comes home and I, I say that this happened oh, and, he, and that's when he confesses that he took out a $50,000 loan against the house for the business. And, in, and in Oregon, you only need one signature, or at least at the time you didn't have to have both signatures and technically the house is still under his name. So I don't know that it mattered if my signature is on it or not. Um, and I said, what? He goes, oh, I've got in a little trouble with the shop and I needed money fast. I couldn't pay my vendors. I said, well, what about this loan? This hasn't been paid. And he's like, well, we can start making the minimum payments on it. I said, well, I'm already paying everything. I'm already working a second job. I, I said, you need to call your dad. You need to ask for some money. And, and his face lost color. He's like, I can't do that. And I said, there, we don't have, there, the, the house is going for auction February 24th. And this is right after Christmas. You know, this is, this is the beginning of 2009. I said, we don't, there, there, we have nothing to pay this. And they're going to, they're going to auction the house and we're on the street. And, and he said, fine, I'll call him. And, and he calls his dad and his dad gives us a loan with a, with a payment plus interest on it. Um, it's very small, something that I can pay. And I said, you know, we need a fresh start. This, you need to shut that shop down. It is, it's, it's just, it's not going anywhere. It's time to sell everything off that you can. And 
you know, we've been talking about moving to Arizona for so long. I said, I think Simon moved to Arizona and his parents had a home in Arizona. So it was a kind of an easy transition to come here and stay with them so we could get our own place kind of a thing. So we did where he left. So, so this is, so we're, we're gearing up, selling off everything at the shop. Um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, um, applying for like a transfer with my job, everything else. And, and he leaves for a job that he gets, he finds online and he heads to Arizona four months before I do this. So this is the start of 2010 and he heads to Arizona and I'm left to sell the house, which I have no idea how to do. Um, and our agent was saying, you know, Hey, there's a couple things that, that need to be repaired. So I'm left trying to figure out how to repair things. At this time, I'm 21 years old. So I'm a 21 year old girl trying to, to <laughs> figure out how to sell a house <laughs> and pack up and everything else. And, um, and finally by, by July of 2010, the house is sold. Fortunately, it, it was never underwater. We were, we were always good on the, the, and there was a big down payment on the house, but, um, we are left with $1,100. So we're on the red. All of the debt is paid and we're left over with $1,100 and that's it. And whatever he's bringing in from his new job. And we, we drive to Arizona and we kind of temporarily stay, um, stay in Tucson for a while before moving to Phoenix. And I'm thinking, all right, we're going to work. This is a new start. We're going to turn this around. We're going to, you know, new place, new everything. You have, you have to be honest with me going forward. You can't, you can't, you can never do this again, kind of a thing. And, um, I was talking to his mom one day and she was like, yeah, I thought it was pretty weird that you guys called for that loan. And I had just given, we had just given him $185,000 and I live my face what? literally dropped. Yeah, yeah. My face literally dropped. And I said, and she go, she looked at me and she goes, oh my God, you didn't know. She could just see it on my face that I didn't know. I said, what? She goes, yeah, we gave you $185,000 for the wedding, or, you know, as a wedding gift and to get your life started. And she goes, I said, he told me you gave him $20,000 to open the shop. She goes, well, yeah, he said he was going to use $20,000 to open the shop, but, um, but we get he we we gave you one hundred eighty five thousand. I said, well, what happened to what the other one sixty five? She goes, I have no idea. She goes, when you guys called to ask for for the loan to cover the debt, we were both confused. And I right then and there, I thought, oh oh god, oh my god, you know, what what else do I not know? Can I make a guess? <laughs> yeah, yep, he, has a, he has a gambling problem. Yes. Yes, one hundred percent. Yes, um, and it goes on for a long time. I, I don't, I don't, I to this day, I think it's still happening, um, but it's gone. It's all gone. And I say to him, I know about the. Your mom told me this, and then he's pissed at his mom, right? She doesn't mind her goddamn business. She's always been like this. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She doesn't need to say things like this to you. And I was like, this is, this is not your mom. Your mom is not the enemy here. You're the one who chose not, not to say anything about this gift. And you're the one who chose to make it disappear somehow. And he said, well, why don't we go to counseling? Why don't we go? So this is our first round in counseling. And we go to a Christian counselor. And by this time, we have moved into a, a little house in Phoenix, and, oh, by the way, we can't buy again. For whatever reason, we can't buy a house again. And he's saying he's saying it's my fault because I don't have a solid job yet. Because I was just, like, working temporary jobs. Again, it's 2010, so things are rough. And and I, I say, okay, well, I, I guess maybe it is. Um, you know, I said, but you're a veteran, so have you ever used your VA loan? And he said, he said, well, no, but maybe we can do that. And you know, maybe we can look in that after you get your job. 
So we rent a little house in, in Phoenix and we start counseling too after I find out about this 185. And we're going, we're going through counseling and, and I'm bringing up all this stuff and he's got an excuse for all of it. And it's a Christian counselor and, and not to, not to rag on Christians. I'm sure there's a lot of, there's a lot of women that listen that their faith is, is what's, is what's getting them through these things too. For me, it was, it was weaponized against me. Um, it was not my place to ask about money. It was not my, uh, you know, I'm the wife. I should be serving and honoring my husband by serving him. And the, this Christian council really sold that uh, bullshit, honestly. So I have a one question. Was he overly religious or did he know that your religious background would play into things? So he specifically wanted to go see the religious counselor instead of a regular therapist, non-religious. Um, he knew that, that, I had a lot of religious guilt and, but he, did, he wasn't, I had asked him to go to church with me on the weekend on Sundays. And he was like, no, that's not for me. So he, he was never a participant, but he did, like I said, he grew up in a Christian family. So he did know the Bible and he did know his verses and he did know what worked in his favor as far as, as Christian standards go. So he knew he played along in the belief that I was supposed to be subordinate to him, that he was the head of our household or the leader of our family. He, he was very good at that. So him, him picking this religious counselor was very strategic. And I, at the time I was on board because, because I was still, I was still guided, I guess, in, in my religious beliefs. It was still something that I fell back on. Even though I wasn't major practicing, I didn't read my Bible daily. It wasn't like that, but it was still just part of my foundation. So you go to this religious counselor, everything goes pretty much in his favor. You you stay within the relationship and then eventually you to have children together. So when you Well, got- that's, that's where the counselor comes into play because in that time, I said I wanted a divorce. I told him right then and there. So we're three years married by this time, two, two and a half years married, three years married. I say, I, I can't do this. You lie. There's so much money missing. I don't know what else you're lying about. I, I want a divorce. And he said, you will go to hell if you divorce me. And the Christian counselor wrapped that up a little more sweetly, but basically concurred. Yeah, yeah, it's a righteous woman does not leave her husband. And you soon after make the decision to have children. The counselor, we get to about six months of, we, this is why another reason I don't, want, I don't really care for Christian counselors because they think the solution is having sex with your husband. This, this makes everything right when a woman sexes up her husband. We come to the end of the counseling and the counselor says, you know, now we get to the point where, where we reintroduce intimacy in a relationship. And I, I think that this would be really beneficial for you guys to, to do a date night and, and be intimate with one another. And so I'm thinking this is my duty. I'm, I'm still not, I'm still resentful. I'm still not trusting a word that comes out of his mouth. I'm still having all these doubts, but I'm also plagued with, uh, with my, like religious voice in my head, you know? And I say, okay, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe I've been withholding sex and, and that's just driving this resentment between us too. And so we have sex that night. I hadn't been on birth control either. So we'd been in, in, um, counseling for six months, not having sex, you know, I, I, I'm not, I never really liked birth control. It doesn't, it makes you kind of feel like garbage. And I get pregnant that night. Now I remember in the morning, waking up in the morning thinking, Oh God, I'm pregnant. I know it. And sure enough, pregnant with my first child and it's my first daughter. And I just think, okay, well, maybe this will get, this will get it together. Right. He'll, he'll, he'll get it together. and, And now it's time to be a dad and a family man and be committed. So during my pregnancy, he gets this really great job, really great job. And 
we're making a lot of money. And I mean, I'm talking, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month in 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 our take home, you know. So he goes in he goes into business with or he's he's working for this company and they they there's like a side one of their clients says, Hey, we need this, but we can't get it. There's nobody who does it who recruits and um, kind of wrangles linemen, like power linemen. We have this huge contractor in Calgary, Canada, and they need linemen. And I guess there are not enough in Calgary, but if we could bring, if you have them in the States and we could contract them here, there's so much infrastructure being built in Calgary. And and so he and this his his coworker say, let's let's do this, but let's let's make our own lineman business. Let's leave this company and start our own lineman company. And this guy, this business partner, I remember when he was telling me this, I said, you know, if you want to do this, because this was his client who said it, I said, if you want to just why don't you just do this on your own? You don't need this guy. Something something about him rubs me the wrong way. Why why don't you just do this on your own? And he was like, you don't know anything about business. You raise our baby. This is, this is a, this is, I'm, I'm going to do this. So he, they, used to, they break up, they make their own company and they take this contract in Calgary. The, the Calgary contract required him to be in Calgary one week a month, every month. Sometimes he would fly, sometimes he would drive. And, and he, t- and I, at this time, we're making so much money that I don't even have to work during my pregnancy. So he says, you, you quit your job, you know, you just, you be a bit stay at home wife and, and enjoy your pregnancy. So this job is going on. I'm used to him being gone one week a month, every month in Canada. We are, our savings, we have so much cash in our savings that I keep saying, why aren't we using, why aren't we buying a house? Like, why, why are we staying in this dumpy rental? Like, why aren't we buying a house? I said, you can, let's do the VA. It's 0% down. And then we have all this cash. We could basically pay for a house in cash. No, 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 no. I'll have to look into it right now. I'm too busy with this Calgary contract. And I'm about eight months pregnant. So pretty big. Uh, and this was my first pregnancy. So I really like enjoyed it. Um, I'm in this car and I open the console. I'm looking for gum or something stupid. And I find Viagra, like a Canadian prescription of Viagra in the console. And I was like, what the hell is this? And he kind of just, without missing a beat, he didn't stagger. It didn't seem like I caught him in a lie or anything. He goes, you've just gotten so big. I've needed the help. Uh, and I, I didn't question it any further. I didn't, I was just embarrassed. I was mortified. Like, oh my God, am I really that big? You know, I'm, I'm having a baby. Of course I'm that big. I'm having your baby. Um, what I can't, but I didn't immediately go, oh, he's got, there's somebody in Canada. Obviously he's got, he's seeing somebody in Canada. I just took his word for it that like I was not attractive enough at that time. And again, throughout our whole relationship, he doesn't love bomb. He lusts bomb. So it's always about how I'm, he's bringing me, he always gave me a lot of gifts as far as like sexy dresses and, and high heels. And, you know, um, I, I slowly started to look like a Barbie doll. So, so for him to say, you are too big, I need erectile dysfunction help, that was a huge wound. It was a huge wound. Um, so we, we had our baby and I never brought up again. I never, I never said anything again. We had our baby and he's drinking a lot at this point too. I, I had said, I'd even said him one night, why are you drinking so much? And he's just like this contract Canada just has me so busy. Like I, I'm stressed. And I was like, I don't think drinking is like the solution. Um, and, but you know, what do you know? You're not running a business. I told you you're, you're, you're in charge of my, of, of raising our family. You worry about you. I'll worry about me and the business and the money. 
And he's still going to poker clubs, too. But he told me they were just for points. Um, you know, like I told you when we were chatting before recording, I, I often said to myself, God, you're such a stupid girl after, after the divorce. How could you have been so stupid? My thing is, I was honest in the relationship all the time. You know, like, I, I was earnest. In, in being his wife and partner. And, you know, if I wanted a $500 purse, I didn't just buy that. I would go to him and say, hey, I, I'd like this purse. I, I you know, do you, do you care if I get it? You know, I was always, I was always um, leading with honesty because I thought that's what you did. So I would just, just, why wouldn't I assume that he is, he too is in this partnership? Why, why would I assume that he would just lie about playing for a point. I mean, I guess granted, you know, after all the other money mysteries, I should have stopped believing he was doing anything in earnest, but, um, but we had, we had finished counseling, you know, so I thought he's a changed man and he was always good after counseling too, you know? Um, I just wondered why I never questioned whether or not he's playing poker for points because, because I, I am where I say I'm going to be, you know, if I'm at Nordstrom, I say I was at Nordstrom for the day. There, I have no reason to lie about it. So I kind of thought he played in the same realm as I did, but no, you know, um, he, he probably wasn't playing for points. <laughs> More than likely not. Anyway, so we, we have our baby and, um, uh, and I'm nursing. And when you are breastfeeding a child, you are burning so many calories. You are starving. You're starving. You're just so hungry. Worse than when you're pregnant. You're so hungry. And he came marching out of his off his home office one day and he's just like, you eat too much. You've gotten way too fat. I'm probably four weeks postpartum. I mean, barely, barely have. And I had a C-section too. So I, could, I couldn't even walk. I couldn't stand fully upright from the C-section. And so, and you're not supposed to do anything until after six weeks postpartum. So I get online and I look for like a mom baby exercise group and find one and I start it right away. And while I'm nursing, before I have a doctor's okay to, to even exercise, um, and he's very happy about this. Oh, I'm so glad you found this exercise program. But like I said, he's drinking a lot, so he's putting on a lot of weight. But I'm the one with with a body problem, according to him. In the long run, that exercise group became the best, became my way out in in a roundabout way. But uh, I'll get to that. So, I within having your first child, because you have two, mm -hmm. are there? changing tactics that happen in between to keep you around until, you know, the beginning of the end and then the end of your relationship. And, you know, within that time, are there any uh, major events that uh, happen or is it a lot of more of the same as far as how you're being devalued uh, him uh, cheating and, you know, making excuses and you forgive or, or you, um, you know, being manipulated into taking those excuses. Uh, I guess what is your biggest struggle within, in that time before, uh, it all eventually crumbles? Right. Um, well, I guess the biggest struggle is, is honesty. Like he's still never honest, but he, but he's bringing in so much money and I don't work. So now I'm kind of, I don't work and I don't have a formal education. So I'm kind of trapped. It's not like I can rescue myself from anything. So I put up with a lot of stuff. We move into a much bigger house in a, not in a fancy suburb, but we're renting again. And I, I can't, you know, I'm like, again, there's an excuse about the VA loan. Um, and then, and there we have our second child, our second daughter. And on Father's Day, we get served with a lawsuit, a $7 million lawsuit from this business partner. And we go through that lawsuit for four years. And they are saying that he defrauded the company. 
Um, they're saying that he stole clients and misappropriated funds, but he's denying all of this. You know, I, at the time I was driving a Range Rover and it, it was taken by the court. It was seized. And I, I was like, what? You know, I was just like this life, this house of cards was crumbling. Um, but in that time, you know, he is, he does placate me a lot with gifts. And again, growing up with nothing, they, they did. I, I was totally, I, I was, I was shallow enough to be bought off all the time. I'd catch him in a lie. I'd catch him chatting with a girl. I'd catch him talking to a bartender from, you know, some sleazy place online or whatnot. And I would have a new handbag. Um, I would have new shoes. I would have, um, rims put on my Range Rover, you know, like I, there was always something to shut me up in that time. But then we're served with this lawsuit and assets are frozen. We have to move out of the big fancy house into another small dumpy rental and going through that lawsuit. He's drinking and drinking and drinking all the time. To, like he would just drink himself silly on the couch and pass out on the couch. We weren't sharing a bed. We weren't sharing a room. If he wasn't sleeping on the couch, he was in the guest room. So we were no longer sleeping together. Um, he was becoming more verbally nasty. I don't necessarily want to say abusive because he wasn't like calling me names or anything. It was just like, I could do, I could do no right. You know, I, dinner wasn't cooked right or, or I didn't, I I wasn't formally educated. I couldn't understand. Um, also during this time I had asked during the, when the money was really coming in before the lawsuit, I had asked if I could go to nursing school. And I've been saying it for a long time. Like, I would really love to go to nursing school. And he was like, I don't think that you would fare well in a, with a formal education. I don't think you're going to like college. You don't seem like the type that that could handle college. So I had this idea that I wasn't smart enough. Um, even though I had a 4.0 in high school, I don't know why I let him make me believe this. But, but because I didn't grasp the ins and outs of the lawsuit and the money and the contract in Canada that somehow made me exempt from knowing anything that was happening. Even though my name was in the lawsuit, but I, you know, I I'm named in the lawsuit because, because this, this is Arizona. And if one spouse owns a business, the other spouse's name is on it. Um, so before the lawsuit has even gone on here or been brought up to you guys, you, at that point, he, he'd he gotten his life back on track in a way. In, in, the, in a way. In a sense of like, okay, this guy wasn't here to exploit me and, you know, do nothing, et cetera, et cetera, while I was being the breadwinner. He really does have these skills. He really is that maybe the guy that I met originally. He is a go-getter. But now you find out that he is a go-getter, but he's just not always on the up and up on whatever he is doing here. And again, whatever he touches, for the most part, if you just give it enough time, he'll have it implode on him. Yes, yes. Perfect way of describing that. Yeah, he he just... Um... He doesn't do anything honestly, but I don't find out until it's too late, you know, or until it's, until there's collateral damage everywhere, you know, until I'm, I'm named in a $7 million lawsuit. I don't, I just. Which at that point, then, at that point has to be devastating because you've, you've lived a, a life in the sense of, you know, you clawed your way to get where you were in, in all aspects of things and to find yourself, oh my God, I owe X amount of dollars on uh, my house that's not being paid. I'm not the one that did that. All of a sudden, I'm on the hook for it. Now, my my husband, yes, I've been living a nicer lifestyle because of what's been coming in, but all of a sudden, I'm on a lawsuit for $7 million. Yes. I just wanted to live a normal life. And And the money and lifestyle in that time, you know, he was still, he was still, he was still a creep during that time, but the money and lifestyle were, like I said, placating me. Like it was enough to be distracted by. And, you know, we took a nanny to Hawaii on a vacation. You know, it was, it was, 
it was enough to still be like, you know what, my life, some people have it worse and I'll put up with his, you know, his garbage, his bad attitude, his whatever. So you're, you're on the lawsuit and again, now your life is thrown up in the air. You're back, uh, you know, you're four people living in a smaller place and I guess what happens from there? So from there, the lawsuit kind of wraps up and, and the, they settle and the settlement basically covers the lawyer's bills. So everybody is out at square one. So fortunately we're not in a huge financial debt. Um, and we have about a hundred thousand dollars in cash in savings. And I wake up one morning after the lawsuit and $50,000 is gone, just gone. And, and in this time he's looking for another job, right? He's sending out resumes, but $50,000 is gone. And I said, I said right away, Hey, did something happen with the account? 50, 50 grand is gone. This is all we have to live off of until you get a new job. And, and he goes, yeah, I, I moved it. I said, what do you mean you moved it? He goes, I moved it. And I said, well, where'd you go? Where, where to? And he's like, I'm going to open up. I'm going to run my own lineman company. I'm going to do this. I'm going to keep doing this. There's a lot of money in it. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm just going to go out on my own. I said, well, you didn't even talk to me about it. He goes, I didn't have to talk to you about it. God told me this is what I needed to do. And so I moved the money. And I look back and now I laugh, but at the time I go, well, how do I argue with God? I mean, God told him that this is what he's supposed to do. This is what he's supposed to do. And, and <laughs> anybody that says God told me to, to lie to my partner about how much money or not, or to deceive my partner about money <laughs> is a liar. Um, but I didn't, I, again, I went along with it, but by, by this time though, I do want to say by this time I am, I am the wheels of a plan are starting to turn because I, I I'm going, this guy, this guy's going to get me in a lot of trouble. Something's going to happen to us or him. And I'm either going to be a single mom in mass amounts of reparation debt, you know, what, whoever he's messed up and I'm on the hook for, um, or, or we're both going to end up in jail for some sort of financial fraud. I, I had just, I had the, I had started to see the light a little bit. And like I said, I was part of that fitness group. I started, I, 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 I really wasn't allowed to work. My, my job was to be the mom. I had two kids, I had a baby and a toddler. And also he's not a very hands-on dad either. When it looks good, it looks good, but he doesn't change diapers. He doesn't do midnight feedings. He doesn't get up because he's the breadwinner. He's the worker. He's, he's the guy. That's my role. I don't have a job. You know, I went through some postpartum depression. I didn't really get a lot of support in that. Um, he, that's not his job. That's my job. So, so I'm already feeling like a single mom, and especially at post lawsuit where I don't have the money to distract me anymore. Um, you know, yeah. So I'm, I'm starting. I'm starting to see the light. So this fitness thing I was doing. I just say, Hey, I want to, I, I love these other moms and got this peppy personality. I, I think I'd be really great teaching, you know, having a little hobby job, teaching one, one day a week. And he was like, yeah, sure. That's fine. So I got my certification and I started teaching and, and, um, and then I moved on to get a national certification from there. So he's, he's rebuilding his lineman business and it's going, it's going well, it's starting to pick up, like things are getting better. And again, I bring up buying a house, you know, by this time we are in Arizona eight years, we don't have a house yet. You know, I say, uh, can you apply for the VA loan? He goes, well, you know, in 2010, when we first talked about this, the VA was moving, was moving all of their paper records to electronic records and mine got lost. So I've been, I had to file a grievance and you know how the government works. It takes a long time, but they can't find record of my service. And I was like, what? 
And again, we're not sleeping together. We're not in the same room. You know, we, we finished off the last seven years of our relationship in separate bedrooms. He was drinking through all of it. And, um, but you know, his business is getting back on track. And so we have enough cash in our savings to pay for a, like a town home in cash. So we pay for it in cash. And he's using this idea that we need to just stay out of debt. You know, like God, God does not want us to be a slave to our debt. That means the debt, the creditor is our master and we don't have masters as God fearing people. Again, I fall for this crap. And we move from the rental, the business, his new business is going well. I'm teaching fitness. I've got two kids into this townhome and I'm washing dishes. We have like a galley kitchen and I'm washing dishes one night. And what he had started to do, I I'd started to mention the drinking again, like, Hey, can you cut it back? So what he had started to do was twist caps back on the empty bottles and put it back in the little case, the little carrier, six pack carrier. So when I would open the fridge, it might look like he just had one for the night. So I, I'm believing that he's cutting back, but he, he's had the whole thing. You know, I just don't, I don't realize that the way I find out this is so stupid. So I'm doing dishes one night in the kitchen and I say, you know, we're in our new town home. It's real nice. It's been remodeled. It's beautiful. And I say, you know, I'd love to have a housekeeper maybe once a month come in and do the windows and the baseboards. And he has like this nasty, spooky, calm tone. And he goes, you, I hear him go, you are perfectly capable of getting on your goddamn knees and scrubbing the baseboards. And I, I froze. I was like, what the fuck? And I kept the water running and I go and look in the fridge and there's a six pack. And you know, when you're anticipating picking something up and you're anticipating the weight of it, you know, you know, a six pack of beer is going to feel a certain kind of weight. So you brace yourself for that. I did that. And the whole thing went flying out and the beer bottles crashed everywhere, broke all over the floor. And he got up and, and by this time he's in my, he's puffed up his chest. He's in my face and he slams me into our dining room table. And it was in that moment that I knew this would only get worse. This is not going to be better. I'm not going to be that woman. It's one thing you've been cheating. You've lied. You've stolen money. But I am not going to be that woman that lets her daughters see her be physically abused. They will pick men like that. No, not doing it. So I called his mom and I said, your son just slammed me in, into the table. By this time, they're in their Oregon home. They have they have a few homes, Hawaii, Oregon, Arizona. And she books me and my daughter's a flight right away. We get on a plane and we fly to her house and stay for the week in Oregon. I learned he does not have a degree in social anthropology. And what a good, what a good topic to say that nobody's going to go, nobody knows what that is. You know, nobody's going to go, huh? Oh, you know, if you say I have a degree in psychology, you'd be like, Oh, so, so do you, you know, what do you think of Erickson's life? Whatever. There's stuff that, that like the, the lay person knows about certain fields, but social anthropology, you don't go, you don't, you, you go, Oh, okay. Uh-huh. So you, yeah. Doesn't have a degree. Never went to university of Minnesota. He went to a community college somewhere nearby, got an associates of science and something. Um, they don't, his parents don't know if he actually finished the military. They know he went to the air force because they visited him on base in Germany. But all of a sudden he was home and saying he was going, that he was going to school in Minnesota after four years. So they don't know if he was honorably discharged or not. There's, and I still, I know I can, I can use the freedom of information act and, and write, to the air force and asked, but I don't really care that much. Honestly, he lies, you know? Um, but that might explain why the VA, the whole VA story never worked out. Um, his parents were just sort of like, they too couldn't believe the things I was being told. 
that he, that I said that he told me because they, I told them like they made, he made me believe that they, you know, weren't very nice people, but that had never been my experience with them. You know, they were, they were very generous to me and the girls and his mom, his mom pulled me aside and she said, you know, I think you're a good mom. And she goes, you know, I refer to you as my daughter in love, not my daughter-in-law. She goes, I think you need to leave him. She gave me her blessing and they're, you know, like I said, they're staunch Christians who don't really believe that. But she's like, you know, I told them about the pot. I told them about, um, the drinking, um, you know, my father-in-law, my former father-in-law said, you know, um, addiction is, is like an affair. You know, you're, you're sneaking behind someone's back. You have a relationship that you can't get enough of. And, um, he goes, you know, in the Bible, it says you can leave, you can leave under for two reasons. And infidelity is one of them. He's like, I, I would call somebody's relationship with drugs and alcohol, a relationship and infidelity. Um, so I went back home, I flew back after a week and, and I started, I knew it was going to take some time. By this time I started working for a gym um, teaching their teaching, uh, fitness classes for them. And I went to my boss and said, you know, I, I, I need a different position or I need more stability. Um, I got a secret credit card so that I could get a lawyer. And I started the process of divorcing him, which was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying because at first I thought I'm going to play nice. If I play nice and he'll play nice, but you can only play nice with nice people. If the other person's not nice, they're not, they're not all of a sudden going to be nice for your sake. He never once during the, during the process, he, he refused to move out. So we had to live in the same house on, you know, for 90 days while the court processed the first half of the divorce request. So that was just a nightmare in and of itself. He was going through my emails. Um, I didn't know this. He had accessed them through a different, he had already access, had accessed them earlier through a different computer in the house, which I didn't know he had. So he was monitoring my emails and somehow he always knew where I was too during that time. So I don't know if he was using some sort of tracking device on my car or if he had just I'm not like a tech person, so I don't know if he did something with my phone to where he could track it. Because anything, anything I looked at on my phone was also showing up on my search history in my computer, which I didn't know they linked like that. So he would see like any time I would read divorce forums or look for um, advice, he knew he knew everything that I was doing. I didn't know how. A friend, a mutual friend of ours, a couple friend. The husband came to me and, you know, I guess he had been blabbing to this guy, like on drunken nights if they'd go out or whatnot. And at one point the, the husband got so upset at the way that he was behaving that he came to tell me like, you know, you're being, you're, he knows everything you're doing. He knows you're a lawyer. He knows you have a lawyer. He knows you have, um, he knows you've been working on uh, getting a new job. He knows that you've looked at custody, you know, like the custody, um, stipulations that Arizona requires. He knows everything. And I just re I remember we're living in the same house. I was sick. I remember throwing up because I was terrified, terrified of what was going to happen. And one final thing the, hus the husband told me was, he goes, and this is when it, this was the nail on the coffin for me. Cause I had kind of gone back and forth. Like, do I tear up my family? Do I just put up with this? You know, my daughter's five. Do I just do 13 more years? Um, and he said, he's also questioning the paternity of your youngest child. And my heart broke, my heart broke. And not even because he thought he tried to, to smear me and in, in thinking that, you know, trying to make people think I had an affair or whatnot. But because that's your daughter and you know that's your daughter. Why would you why would you use her in your in your as 
evidence of your case, basically, you know, like how you're being wronged. Why would you? Or, or just, or just a, a pawn in a game, and this isn't a game, and your child is not a pawn. Yes, and that for me, that was the moment when I, let, I said, you know what? I don't care about the money. I don't care if I get nothing. I don't care if I have to start over from square one because I was 31 at this time. I don't care if I have to do all of it all over again. If he can sink this low, what will he do? What will what will these girls turn out to be like? What kind of men will they choose to be their men? And it, that was enough for me. That was enough. I, I called the lawyer the minute I was I was done with my meeting with this with this mutual friend. I called and I said, "File it, file it. Try, let's see what we can get. Let's let's do what we can." And that's when we hired. That's when I he said, "You know, you should hire a forensic accountant because we had a." a business bank account that I knew about that had $350,000 cash. And my lawyer said, take half of that cash. That's yours, but you need to take it now. So I called Wells Fargo and they said, your name's no longer on the account. I said, what? <laughs> yeah, your, your name is no longer on this account. You don't, you no longer have access to, to this money. And it was, it was $350,000 was magically gone. So he had already, he had, he was already, he was already, he was always one step ahead of me in this because I don't think maliciously. I don't lead maliciously. I was, like I said, I was hoping to play nice and I was thinking, well, I'm the mother of his children. He's not going to let me starve or, or I have a right to this money, but not if he moved it and not if he moved it before I officially filed, then it doesn't look like anything. It looks like a business transaction. It doesn't look like you're moving funds. So he moved it. Um, I'm guessing he moved it to him to his dad's account or something, um, or open a new account with it. I'm not sure. Um, so that went missing. And then the forensic accountant told me that the taxes, the, the business tax, taxes hadn't been paid for the last five years. And I was terrified, terrified. That's tax fraud. That's jail time. That's my name is on this business. That is, I called a meeting with him, with my ex or my narc. And I said, you have not, but, but let me back up actually for the last five years, you know, I'm working this little fitness gig and every tax season he's going, Hey, where's your 1099? Where's your W2? I'm off to see the CPA. So I was always handing him my documents over and he was acting out this part of, of going to see going to do the taxes every year. Why bother? You know, <laughs> but I would add, you know, I would say, oh, tax season, blah, blah, blah. And again, I guess I, I felt like afterward, I'm like, you're such a stupid girl. I have to sign, you know, when we file taxes, I have to sign. So I don't know why I wasn't thinking that I, I should be signing like, I'm not seeing these tax, I'm not seeing these papers ready to be filed every season to sign, but I just am assuming that he's taking care of it, that he knows more than I do. I don't, I'm not smart enough to, you know, I've been made to believe that I'm not smart enough to make important business decisions, especially financial ones. Um, so, so I don't say, I don't, I don't, I don't look into it. I don't question it. But they hadn't been filed. The last five years of, of the, his newest business had not been filed. And and that's when he was ready to negotiate in the divorce because he didn't want me to call the IRS. And we wrote out my lawyer and everything and his lawyer drafted out a, a form that said, like, I had nothing. I didn't know about this. He's going to make an effort to contact. Because if you do call the IRS and you use you, you Say, hey, I've made a mistake. They work with you. What you don't want is the IRS coming for you. But if you call them proactively and say, I've messed up. So it was put in legal writing that he would do that. He would contact the IRS. He would start making working out a payment plan with them. And, um, and it was solely his responsibility. And that he would pay me alimony. Uh, I, I actually got like a, um, like a settlement from the business. Um, and I used that to, to, and I got to keep my house too. That was also in my settlement. So I have this condo or this town home. I have a small stipend of money and 
and I have nothing more. And we have to have 50-50 custody in Arizona. It's the law. Um, they, their, their child custody here is pretty, you have to basically catch your, in order to get full custody, you pretty much have to catch your spouse like on camera doing something harmful to your children in order for the judge. Otherwise, they don't want to tear, they don't want to disrupt the children too much. Um, so now that that happened and you're a single mom, you're divorced, you have a little bit of money and at least he is going to pay alimony. I don't know if he continues to pay alimony. You never know. Um, where did you begin as far as what just happened to me? What was I dealing with? Who was this person? Who do I trust again? And the whole healing process of everything. And as far as his family goes, I assume that they're still involved with the grandchildren and you have a decent relationship with them. Right. So, okay. So I, I have um, no contact with his family. Okay. Unfortunately. So his mom did pass during this divorce. She passed of ovarian cancer in the middle of this divorce. Um, and he did try and use that. And it was like, my mom is dying, but I thought, well, you know, whether his mom's dead or his mom's alive, he's still going to be this way. Um, but his sister had contacted me and she, we had always had a nice relationship. And she said, you know, I, I'm sorry that this has happened, but we have to, we want to see those girls and we still have him in our life. And for the peace, we have to choose him in an effort to see the girls. And I said, well, I would never, I would never not let you see the girls. And she goes, no, no, I, I'm not saying that. She goes, but he's still in our life and we don't want him to, um, to interfere with that either. You know, they didn't want him to met, to manipulate them with the girls, use the girls to manipulate them. She said, so we have to cut off contact with you and we wish you, well, there's no hard feelings. We understand what happened, but you know, we, I, we have to choose my brother. And that's where things have left with, with his family. Um, as far as that goes, um, I, it took me, it took me a while to heal. It took me a while to stop blaming myself. Like I said, I called myself a stupid girl. God, every day I had a solid, a solid group of girlfriends and I moved one of my girlfriends into my house. Actually, she, I've known her for 10 years and, um, and my girls love her. And I just said, you know, I just can't, you can do whatever you want. We don't have to be traditional roommates where we're like, you know, making plans. Our weekends are revolving around one another. I just don't like the quiet of my, of my house. I don't like sitting in the quiet because then I think and I, I ruminate and, and it gets very dark for me. And so this was, she was a huge blessing of just having her in my, in my house. I also signed up for nursing school almost the minute my, the ink on my divorce was dry. And that kept me very busy and very distracted. And I'm at the tail end of it. Um, and the funny thing is, and I don't even, I'm not even trying to be braggy, but I'm doing very well. I, I have a high GPA. I made the Dean's list, like all of these things that like I was meant to believe about myself as far as like not being smart enough to, to handle real life. I, I'm nursing school is no joke. It, that it is brutal. And, and I'm at the top of my class, you know? So I, I just allowed him to, to let me believe too many falsities about myself, but the, the healing process took a long time. I also, I tr tried dating for a while or I was casually dating and I committed to not being in a relationship. I had absolutely, I was like, I don't want to, but I had never really dated. You know, I met him at 19. I'm like, I'm just gonna have fun. I'm going to go out with if somebody, at, you know, with this, that online dating was like a new thing, you know, that wasn't around when I was dating. So I was like, I'm going to give this a try. And, and I would basically say yes to anybody who was like, do you want to have dinner? I'd be like, yeah, that sounds great. You're not really my type, but I don't care. Let's have a good time. I found though that the three, that three out of some of these guys I dated that I fell kind of hard for were exactly my ex. And they were leading with God, you're sexy and you're 
beautiful and I love your body and you're, you know, leading with a lot of lust on me again. And I realized that's a problem with me. I, I have to take accountability for, for what I'm allowing and, and I'm allowing myself to be distracted by that. And those, those three guys that did that, um, were exactly like my narc. Exactly. And I realized I'm picking him all over again. And so I kind of took a break. I was like, I, I'm, I'm going to spend time with myself, with my daughters, my girlfriends. I went on a few girls trips. And by the time that I was ready to like start dating for real, you know, again, I picked somebody completely different. In fact, I know showed to the first date and <laughs> because I was like, this guy is not even, he's, I mean, he was good looking. It wasn't that it was just like, he just seems a little boring, you know, he's outdoorsy and, um, and very safe. <laughs> Turns out he's like the love of my life. You know, I, I, we are, we got engaged over the summer and, and he's wonderful and totally different and doesn't love bomb and is honest and comes from a very nice family. And, but you know, the thing I found, and I have explained this to some girlfriends is I had to learn how to be in a healthy, in this healthy relationship. And I still, I still have triggers and there are times when the most innocent thing that he does, I'm wondering what the underlying motivation is for it. And, and I'll say, you know, he'll say something to me and I'll be like, well, what's the catch? And he's like, what do you mean? What's the, there's no catch. What are you talking about? You know, I realize that's, that's like an old, it's old wounds for me that I am always suspect that he's up to no good. And, and, and he's not, you know, but I just, have a lot of walls up even still. And he's very patient with that, you know, um, and loving and very good to my girls. Um, so there's, there's hope on the other side, but it took probably about two and a half years of forgiving myself and learning, learning what, what role, what, not even a role, just like what vulnerabilities I allowed people to hone in on. And if you had uh, words of wisdom or advice for others that are going through the same thing, what would it be? To get out. The minute, the minute you're wondering if you should get out, get out. The minute you're wondering if you should record your conversations because, because these people are saying you said X, Y, and Z and you know you didn't or you, you have caught them red-handed and they're making you feel like, you're the one with the problem and there's just that seed in the back of your brain that's saying something's not right. Something isn't right. It's not right. Listen to that. For whatever reason, we decide to ignore our intuitions, even the smartest of us women. We, if, if the person is charming enough, we ignore our intuition and we cannot do that. Well, Frida, I first want to say, you know, that you are smart number 1 i know i know you are feeling that you could have made better decisions and that you don't feel smart for the decisions that that you made not just from our conversation here but from when we spoke before and, and even in our our email and you were with someone here who didn't want you to see the truth and they were always hiding stuff and you uh, the only fault that you have is that you are, are you're, you're a trustworthy person and you want to believe and you had these religious beliefs that were carrying you through here as well so you didn't do anything wrong you know this person you were with when you just told your story here from beginning to end and they are up to no good at every turn of their life and their job when it came to you was to always try and hide things, omit things, lie, and for you to not to see what's going on. And yes, you did spend 15 years of your life there, but that was their job of what they were trying to do every day. I mean, this person made it a point 
of, I'm going to go to the accountant's office today. I need your stuff. Uh, there was all these little things going on to make you think that normal stuff was going on in between the crazy stuff. And those are the little nuances that they'll do and to make you, you know, because everyone thinks in domestic violence situations that it's always bad. But for the most part, there's all this good that masks everything where you're there to for these things happen. So you forget that those bad things happen. So there's, you know, you are smart. I mean, you, your story is of someone who came from nothing, built themselves up, became the breadwinner of the family, was doing well. And then when you guys moved, you were back in a position where you were out, you know, this person got it. So you were now you know, raising two kids. You didn't have a job. And uh, once again, you were put back into the position that this person wanted you to be in. And uh, once again, you came and started making your way back up. You started to do things. You started to shake things up to where you are now. You're back in school. You're almost done. You're going to be a nurse. You're at the top of your class. There's nothing here that says you're dumb at all. You are, you are a smart person. You're a resourceful person. And you're here and you're here to help other people. And today you're going to help a ton of people. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for being here and sharing your story, sharing your truth. You did amazing. And the most amazing thing you did of everything was not even for you, for your two children who are going to know a life uh, free of physical abuse. They don't have to see it. And you, and you cut that out pretty quickly. Uh, and, and you know, you're a great mom and you are going to see them, uh, live their lives and the lives that you want them to have and be, and have partners that are going to be great to them. So, you know, from here, I'm giving you the biggest hugs cause you're wonderful. So, oh, so, 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 thank you. so thank you for being here and sharing your story with me and everyone today. Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to do this. And thank you for doing this podcast because it's, it's touching more lives than maybe we even realize, uh, and I hope it's bringing a little bit of bravery to other women or, or anybody, men, men, women, whomever is in this situation. Well, thank you. And from Frida and myself, we hope you have a good night. <laughs>